Good afternoon, everyone, and a really warm welcome to all of you joining us for our latest Green Sheets webinar. My name's Kate Elliott, and I'm head of the Ethical, Sustainable and Impact Research team at Green Bank. I'll be chairing today's event. For those that are new to Green Bank, we're the specialist ethical and sustainable investment business within Rathbones Group. We've been managing bespoke portfolios for private clients, charities and trusts for over 20 years. And our aim is to integrate our clients' uh, unique sustainable and investment preferences into the management of those portfolios. We've got a long track record of using our investor voice to create positive environmental and social change on a diverse range of issues, from climate change to modern slavery and health and nutrition, both through engaging directly with the companies that we invest in, but also by engaging with policymakers and standard setters with the ambition of enabling a wider system change. The Green Bank team is spread across Bristol, London and Liverpool and Edinburgh, oh, and Glasgow. <laughs> Please do reach out to any of us via the contact details of our website if you'd like to learn more about our services. Now, today's event, we're looking at the effects of climate change and the energy transition on the insurance industry, how the industry is uh, responding to and influencing these factors, and what's being done well and where there's still room for improvement. We're delighted to welcome two speakers today. We have Isabel Le Heretier, Senior Campaigner and org um, Organiser at Insure Our Future, a global campaign of NGOs and social movements that hold the insurance industry accountable for its role in the climate crisis. Isabel will, will reflect on the role of insurance in climate change and the energy transition and share Insure Our Future's assessment, opinions and asks of the industry. I think it's important to note that while Green Bank integrates uh, NGO analysis and benchmarks into our research and analysis of companies, the views that Isabel's going to be sharing today are those of Insure Our Future rather than Green Bank ourselves. We'll also be joined by Joel Swift, an investment manager at Green Bank, who will explain how we look at these issues within Green Bank, how we consider them and build, our, in, build them into our clients' portfolios. A little bit of housekeeping before we dive in. Um, so we'll have our two presentations from the speakers, uh, followed by some time for Q&A at the end. We've had some uh, questions submitted uh, during registration, but if you would like to submit a question at any point during the speakers' presentations, please do so via the engagement panel on the right of your screen. Um, you're welcome to post your questions anonymously if you prefer, and we'll do our best to get through as much as we can. We also have some Green Bank publications available for you to download from the engagement panel on the right hand side of your screen, including our most recent engagement review and investor day reviews. Throughout the presentations, if you're on social media, please use the hashtags Green Bank Investments and Green Sheets. If you do happen to lose connection at any point, then please try and rejoin through the event link. If you're having any issues um, at all using the conference portal, then click on the headphone mic icon in the top right corner. That's available also under the engagement panel under technical support. We'd also be grateful at the end if you could fill in a feedback form, uh, which should take no more than two or three minutes. Uh, your thoughts on how we can uh, improve and evolve these webinars are always much appreciated. But without further ado, on to the topic of today, and Joel, over to you. Thank you, and welcome all. We really do appreciate you joining. The world is getting warmer. 2023 was the hottest year on record. Wildfires, flooding, storm damage and coastal erosion dominate the headlines more often, and from more countries than ever before. The cost of insuring property and the risks from climate change is rising. Of the financial sectors, banks have received the most attention so far for their role in financing the energy transition, but attention is now turning to the insurance sector. Insurers have traditionally been seen as a tool for absorbing financial shock and managing the risks associated with the impacts of climate change, but that is changing. Questions are being asked. Is it enough for insurers to just pull risk and offer a financial service, or should they be delivering more social value by further reducing the risk from natural catastrophes? and incentivizing the transition to a net zero economy. Because insurers are asset managers, risk managers, and institutional investors with hundreds of millions of customers worldwide, they are uniquely positioned to facilitate the energy transition. 
Estimates put the global assets under management of insurers at $40 trillion, a sum which comes with significant firepower and influence. Insurance is required for most projects and is often a condition of owning a property. The scale, frequency and severity of recent natural disasters has led us to ask whether insurers can still effectively model and price climate risk and who is paying for it, the industry, customers or governments? And how can the industry best facilitate the transition to a net zero economy? Isabel and I will give some answers to these questions. So let's start with a poll and I'll return to the results later. There's a poll section on the right hand side of your screen. How much could physical risks from climate change cost the real estate industry by 2050? By physical risk, we mean the damage to people, property and assets from climate change, both in the short term from an extreme event such as a hurricane and in the longer term from higher average temperatures and rising sea levels. This estimate is from a report co-authored by the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Singapore, which looked at the physical risks from climate change to 50,000 real estate assets worldwide. Thank you for voting and I'll reveal the right number later. The insurance sector is notoriously vast and complicated and we could talk about it all day, but given I have about 13 minutes in which to do it, we'll explore what I think are the really core areas. So we'll all be familiar with the experience as customers buying insurance of what are known as primary insurers to insure a property, a car, a specific item, usually to insure against the risk of loss or damage. We pay a premium for the insurer to take this risk for us and to pay out if we claim. The next stage along are the reinsurers. The reinsurers provide insurance to the insurance companies and they help the primary insurers spread their risk and better manage their capital, which in turn in turn can help reduce the risk of major losses on large payouts and also prevent solvency issues. So what are the risks from climate change that I'm referring to? There are three. We've mentioned physical risk already. The second is transition risk, which refers to the potential cost to society from the impacts of changes in government policy, consumer and business behavior, and technologies to transform to a lower carbon economy. Prudential risk is the third and is often less cited. This refers to the risk which could undermine an insurer's financial stability and in turn could erode confidence in the financial system. For example, in 2022, that was the first year in which climate related risk was actively supervised by the UK, UK's Prudential Regulation Authority as a prudential risk. So these risks are growing in prominence and regulators are taking note. But why now? Over the last few years, Reinsurers have been taking significant losses on natural catastrophe claims. Insured natural catastrophe losses, which is the total losses incurred by policyholders due to an event such as a hurricane or earthquake, have exceeded $100 billion for each of the last four years to 2023. 71% of these losses were from North America, 12% Asia, and 11% Europe. And in the first half of this year alone, natural catastrophes have already caused $62 billion of insured losses which is about 70% above the 10-year average. We've even seen flooding in extremely rare areas, such as Dubai, for example. Climate scientists suggest that when the atmosphere is one degree warmer, it can absorb 7% more moisture. This gives more energy for extreme weather events, which, as a chart on screen shows, are increasing in volume and materially overtaking man-made disasters. Pricing risk appropriately is a crucial feature of the insurance industry. Insurers' role as prudent companies means they can't underprice these risks. So why has the price of insurance for natural catastrophes gone up so much? Well, there are three main arguments. Broadly, and this is simplifying what is a very complicated process, insurers model climate risk using software which takes the recorded history of weather events and they simulate a forward-looking view of an asset's exposure to climate risks, which can be adjusted for an asset-specific location, for example. As just one example, Moody's Risk Management Solutions creates models extending far into the 21st century using the work of meteorologists, statisticians, and climatologists to estimate the impact of weather on assets. Now, the first argument is that if insurers have been able to effectively model and price climate risk, why are the number of insured losses far exceeding expectations? Now, some leaders in the industry have openly said that they've been slow to adjust their models for the increased frequency and severity of weather events, which has led to mispricing. But others defend the industry and its investment in modelling over the years, citing instead just the sheer volume and interconnectivity of weather events that have evolved too quickly for historic models to keep up until very recently. 
The second argument is that we can't just look at climate in isolation. Two other factors are just as important, population changes and inflation. On the first, United States census figures show that six of the states most prone to severe weather, including Texas and California, accounted for half of the country's population growth in the 2010s. So a rise in demand for insurance coverage in areas more at risk from natural catastrophes has pushed up prices. And on the second point, we've all experienced inflation over the last few years. You know, again, in the US, construction material costs have increased by 34% and contractor services by about 28%, all since the beginning of 2020. This is adding pressure on premiums pricing as the cost to rebuild a property is much higher now. The third argument, and, and for me, the most material, is, is the growth in what are known as secondary perils. So these are natural catastrophes that are less severe, but more frequent than primary perils such as hurricanes. Secondary perils are things like heavy thunderstorms, floods, droughts, and wildfires. The chief climate scientist at one of U Europe's largest reinsurers recently said that these events could no longer be con considered secondary because in aggregate, they're having the same impact as a primary peril. And the evidence does seem to support this. Secondary peril share of total insured losses globally is rising sharply and has averaged 60% over the last three years. Now, as a result, some insurers, reinsurers have pulled back from covering such secondary perils. They've tightened policies for what they do cover and have pushed up prices for primary insurers to make up for years of historically large losses. Customers are ultimately paying for this too. Isabel will cover more on the affordability, availability, and insurability crisis in insurance, where insurers are pulling out of certain regions and markets because the risks and the costs are too high. Now, you'd think, given the scale of climate risks, that natural catastrophe insurance would be widely held, but this is actually far from reality. The gulf between global, global economic losses from natural disasters, which means all financial losses attributable to a major disaster, and insured losses, i.e. those which are covered by insurance, has remained high. Most insured losses are still in the United States. Again, one of Europe's leading reinsurers has estimated that 63% of expected catastrophe losses in developed markets remain uninsured at the moment. But there is an even bigger divergence here globally. So in developing nations outside North America and Europe, private insurance has covered less than 11% of natural disaster losses since 1980. This compares with 44% in America and about a third in Europe. And this has left governments and their citizens to bear the costs of reconstruction after a natural disaster. And this is exactly the type of disparity that the United Nations Loss and Damage Fund agreed at COP28 seeks to address. And it's also a huge opportunity for the insurance industry. But if no countermeasures are taken, the, protect the protection gap is expected to widen. So what needs to change and what could be done to reduce the protection gap, moderate the price rise cycle and help customers adapt to climate change? Well, let's focus first on what the industry wants going forward. Now, one of the most common asks is for governments to enforce stronger building codes and changes to planning systems to make it harder to build on floodplains and areas susceptible to wildfires. Similarly, further government investment in flood defences, particularly in the UK and Europe, as we've seen in the last few weeks, is high on the agenda. Third is new partnerships between sectors. The insurance industry can't do this on its own. The chief exec of Lloyds of London, the world's largest insurance marketplace, has recently said that banks, which lend money to an asset in an at-risk area, should be prepared to accept more responsibility for the costs that are incurred in any given disaster. Fourthly, there is a call for more funding to research and develop tools that will improve climate risk modeling and also incorporate artificial intelligence. And finally, some industry bodies want new alternative capital to come into the sector to help spread the risk that insurers and reinsurers are taking on and provide more capital to pay for adapting to climate change. The key question we've posed is whether we can insure against climate risk. And building what we've explored already, some further points that would suggest that we can't include the following. The Street Foundation, which is a climate risk modeler, has reported that if climate risk is properly accounted for now, and I argue that it currently isn't for some of the reasons that I've already outlined, then roughly one in four properties in the US are currently overvalued and are stuck in a climate insurance bubble. Secondly, the industry is yet to agree on an approach to the energy transition. And there are tensions between continuing to insure brown industries such as oil and gas and coal 
to help finance the move to net zero and cutting off insurance for those sectors completely. For example, the Net Zero Insurers Alliance was founded in July 2021 to help the industry reduce its own greenhouse gas emissions. It asked its members to commit to net zero by 2050, but less than three years later, the alliance was disbanded in April this year. And that's because many uh, insurers left once US lawyers raised concerns that the targets were violating federal antitrust laws. And as Isabel will explore, some insurers are withdrawing cover entirely from certain regions and certain types of property, and that's leading to what's known as self-insuring and building greater risks into the system. There was a Bloomberg article last year, and that quoted some ultra wealthy property owners who were not taking out expensive insurance, but instead taking steps such as hiring private firefighting squads and building their own outbuildings. But let's look at the positives as well. There are some really innovative ideas. For example, in 2022, the Nature Conservancy announced its purchase of the first ever coral reef insurance policy in the US. This policy is designed to fund coral reef repair in Hawaii in the aftermath of any hurricane or tropical storm damage. There's also growing support for collaborative action. So the head of the catchily named European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, yes, that is a real name, has proposed a national risk sharing scheme and a pan-EU scheme to share the costs of natural catastrophes. There's also more flexibility in the insurance products that are being offered. So a type of insurance known as parametric insurance is enabling more choices for customers and is growing in use. Parametric insurance pays when a claim meets a predetermined index. So for example, the Richter scale for an earthquake or an amount of rainfall for a storm. The insurance should pay out quickly without the need for any actual loss to have occurred or any lengthy loss assessment. It will just pay at a set level. And finally, if I return to the poll question from earlier, where the answer was 500 billion, which the majority of you said, there is such a large gap between the finance currently available and what is needed to fund climate change adaptation measures. The same report where the 500 billion came from said that investing in adaptation measures could bring down the cost of climate risks on properties by $45 billion by 2050. Again, this is a huge opportunity. As investors at Greenbank, we look to invest in companies which are at the very least acting to avoid harm with their products and services and the way they do business. But companies with products and services which benefit people and planet and or contribute to solutions to some of the issues that I've outlined are those which we believe make the most sustainable long-term investments. This is because they tend to be positioning themselves for sustainable growth by meeting an economic, environmental or social need. But crucially, we also look for a willingness from company boards and senior management to engage with investors and other organizations in the industry, such as regulators, NGOs, and their customers. It's only through a collaboration and dialogue can investors, insurers, and the wider finance industry mobilize the great weight of its combined capital to facilitate a just transition to net zero. Thank you for your time and attention. Kate, I'll hand back to you, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Isabel next. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, really, really fascinating overview of an incredibly complex industry there. And I think the, the figures you shared on the protection gap were, were really quite stark and, and shocking, even for, for people who are perhaps familiar with the industry and the challenges it faces. Um, but I'd like to invite our next speaker, um, Isabel, to, to join us and present some of the work that Ensure Our Future is doing. Thank you, Kate, and thank you to the Green Bank team for the invitation and great presentation, Joel, that you just had. So on my side, um, I'll be covering uh, the industry's role, the insurance industry's role in stopping the climate breakdown, what is the state of the industry on climate and energy at the moment, and what makes insurance a very strategic lever for the um, needed energy transition that we face. We can go to the next slide. So here we can see that we have very different scenarios um, of climate engagement for countries on emission targets that will have very different impacts on climate risks to come and on the climate tipping points uh, from now until the end of the century. So as we know, fossil fuel is the number one driver of climate change and the science is clear, the climate science is clear, and the International Energy Agency clearly states that we need to end fossil fuel development and rapidly shift to clean to reach um, net zero. 
And basically, to, en to ensure a sustainable future and insurable world, to continue, we need to stop uh, the source of the uninsurability crisis and the main driver of uh, climate change, which is basically what we work on in the Insure a Future campaign and network. So we can go to the next slide. Um, but at the moment, what we're seeing is uh, that insurance are uh, also being part of the problem as they continue to underwrite and invest in fossil fuel expansion uh, in coal, oil and gas that is not aligned with the climate finance and uh, climate targets. They continue to also underwrite and invest in fossil fuel companies that do not have credible transition plans. And at the same time, what we're seeing uh, increasingly across the world um, is that they are abandoning communities, businesses, and families that are uh, in regions that are the most vulnerable to climates uh, and extreme weather events. So this is a bit of the state of um, the role that they do play in the fossil fuel um, vicious cycle at the moment. We can go to the next slide, please. So I have two questions of poll for, um, for you all. Um, so the first question, uh, to see a bit how much is the insurance sector intertwined with the fossil fuel industry? Um, so first question is how much gross premiums uh, from the fossil fuel industry did insurers receive in 2023? Um, so the first answer is $22 billion USD. Second one is $118 billion USB, uh, USMD. And the third answer is 331 billion. So I'll invite you to vote on this one and we can go to the next slide, please. And the next question is from this amount that you have voted on, uh, which is the amount of money they receive. Um, what percentage of global non-life insurance revenue comes from the fossil fuel underwriting premium? So basically, how much do they profit from it? Uh, how much is it a big part of their revenue? So answer A is 0.5%. Answer B is 5.3%. And answer C is 11%. So I'll let you vote on this. And a bit of drum beat will go to the next slide to reveal the answers. Uh, um, so basically, fossil fuel underwriting isn't a big part of uh, the revenues of insurers. They continue to gain a lot from fossil fuels. Um, so in 2023, the global industry um, profited $22 billion, um, but it's a very small part. It's only 0.5%. So I'll just check here um, the answers that you had. Yeah, it's quite surprising. I was surprised too when I, I've uh, seen these statics, statistics. So basically what it means is that since it represents a small part of their business portfolio for property and casualty, um, it makes it easier for the industry to move away from the sector. So we can go to the next slide, please. And now I'll be diving into how are insurers impacted and responding to the climate um, the climate change that we are we are seeing. So we can go to the next slides on how uh, climate change is impacting insurers. So here you have uh, a couple of graphics that I wanted to highlight. Um, so we are seeing that the costs are increasing dramatically. In 2023, natural disasters cost around 250 billion in damages, of which um, insurance covered 45%. So that's globally. Uh, now, insurance, uh, insured losses exceed 100 billion annually. So that's the recent reports from uh, Swiss Re, Sigma reports. And we are seeing that this is more than double the five year average from the last decade, and it's set to double again. So we're seeing and we're facing huge amounts of losses that will continue to grow. Um, and we are seeing as well that the past is not longer reliable guides to the future for risk planning and that insurers uh, need to rapidly adapt their climate risk um, modelings to be able to model the, um, the risk and tipping points that we will be seeing and facing um, to be able to put in place some measures to um, ensure, ensure uh, insurability and not a growing insur uninsurable world. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. So how 
are they responding to this reality of growing costs? Uh, mostly with two trends of hiking premiums in uh, regions that are uh, highly vulnerable and impacted by extreme weather events. Uh, so this has impact on homeowners, on businesses, and on municipalities that are paying higher costs. Um, and at the same time, one of the trends that we're increasingly seeing, you are seeing it in the UK, I'm pretty sure, uh, maybe with your own home, uh, but we're seeing it across the world. There's more documentation on this um, in, the, in North America, in Europe, and Australia, and Japan, but it's something that's happening uh, all over the world, um, is that insurance companies are, existing, are, are exiting sorry, geographies that are perceived to be too prone for regular extreme weather events. Um, which makes it extremely problematic um, because we are going to be seeing in that case, if that's the continued trends, more and more migration uh, with regions becoming uh, uninsurable and unlivable. So in the end, who ends up paying when uh, this happens? It's municipalities, governments and homeowners. That's the trends that we are seeing. Um, and what we're advocating for at Insure Future Campaign is that it should be polluters that pay higher premiums, uh, not the people that are impacted and most vulnerable to, to the reality that we're facing at the moment. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, how are insurers continuing to respond at the moment? It's pretty much business as usual. Uh, so the recent data has showed that we have uh, insurers uh, have over 500 billion um, in fossil fuel investments. So they not only continue, to underwrite uh, fossil fuels and new fossil fuels. They also invest a lot in, in them, uh, which fuels a vicious cycle of uninsurability. So we can go to the next slide, please. And on the protection gap that Joel um, talked a bit more in depth on than me, um, we are seeing in, in, in majority in the non Western world that um, natural disasters are uninsured. And this is a growing trend all over the world uh, because insurers are struggling to find solutions to narrow the protection gap. Um, so the latest stats that we have in 2023, only 30 31% of the economic losses of global natural disasters were covered by insurance, which is very little. Um, and in Europe specifically, uh, we are seeing only 25 so it's quite small uh, and it's decreasing so there really is an urgent need to try to find a solution for the protection gap there's initiatives that are being proposed um, but at the moment it's uh, it's quite alarming so we can move to the next slide please and even two slides where i'll go into the insure future campaign network that i'm part of um, so our theory of change why we started campaigning on insurance seven years ago in 2017 um, is the fact that for fossil fuel projects to uh, move ahead, they need two, three different things. They need um, funding, they need permits, and they need insurance. Uh, and while fossil fuels uh, need insurance, insurance doesn't need fossil fuels, as I've showed previously on the fact that it's not a big percentage of their income and of their business that is linked to fossil fuels. It's very small. And what is interesting on the um, insurance global markets, specifically for property and casualty, which is what is the type of insurance for energy sector, is that it's a very concentrated market. So globally, we have around 50 insurance companies that, that insure coal, only 50. And for oil and gas, it's even um, smaller. We have the top 10 global insurers that insure around 70% of the market. For the reinsurance market, it's even more concentrated as the seven biggest companies provide more than 50% of global reinsurance capacity. So basically what it, what it means is um, if we are able to move top global insurers um, away from fossil fuel and accelerating the energy transition, it has a huge impact, um, a very, very big impact. Um, and basically when we are able to move them, what impact does it have? So uh, when we have some insurers that um, agree to exclude insuring a project, it sends a signal of risk uh, to other financiers, to other insurers, to the governments. Um, because that's how they base their decisions. It's around risks of the present and of the future. When we have limited offers of projects uh, insurance, it increases the cost and creates delays. 
And when we have uh, policies that are adopted for exclusion, it leads to overall reduction of the insurance provision and shifts basically the market away from this certain sector. So it has a huge impact actually. So I'm going to go to the next slides, please, um, and present quite quickly um, the different demands of the campaign. So we are um, demanding seven different demands of the sector to immediately stop ensuring new and expanded coal, oil and gas projects, stop ensuring new customers from the fossil fuel sector who aren't aligned with a 1.5 pathway. We invite also the industry to divest from um, fossil fuel companies that are not aligned with the 1.5 uh, pathway. We can go to the next slides. Uh, we are also uh, wanting the industry to adopt binding targets for reducing insured emissions. Uh, also explore ways to hold the fossil fuels um, companies legally accountable for climate disasters. So that's the question of who pays and making polluters pay instead of communities and governments, which are already a lot under pressure. Um, we also invite them to ensure uh, that their policies and clients respect human rights and free prior and informed consent, which is both essential for any type of project development for the dirty but for the clean side as well, and also align their public positions and shareholder activities with a 1.5 uh, degrees pathway. So I will go to the next slide, please, to show you progress that has been made because there has been, which is very encouraging. There's still loads to do, but there has been progress. So here you see the graphics of the exclusion policies that have been adopted by insurers um, in the past years. So on coal, we are at 45 companies out of the 50 that I've told you that were uh, on the, the markets. Um, on tar sands and unconventional oil and gas, we are at 26 companies, and on conventional oil and gas, we are at 18. These policies aren't uh, perfect and have some loopholes, but are already good um, first steps, especially on new projects. We will go to the next um, slide, please, which will show you a percentage uh, of the, the, the part of the markets which the exclusion policies cover. Um, so mostly on coal, the impact of this has made it that um, 41% of the primary insurance market and 62% of the of the reinsurance commercial property and casualty markets have adopted policies on coal, which is huge. Um, and the impacts it has is that with the exception of a few, few laggards in the US, Bermuda and East Asia, most insurers are no longer supporting uh, coal in, uh, projects, which has made it that outside of these regions and outside of China, it's become almost impossible to get insurance from um, for new coal projects, which has uh, stopped uh, partly the, the expansion. Um, however, what we're seeing, and you can see this in the graphs on the left, is that there is not enough um, momentum for oil and gas, so this uh, could be much better uh, to make it that we accelerate the energy transition towards clean uh, fast enough, but there already is some progress. Um, we will go to the next slides to just see a couple of examples of uh, best practices. Um, so here um, you can see three examples. They aren't the only ones. There are other good ones um, that you can see in our rankings and scorecards. So Allianz uh, has one of the, the best and a good transition plan and interim targets. Uh, they have bold measures to phase out coal insurance, but they still need to do the same for oil and gas, specifically for gas power plants, pipelines, and LNG terminals. So you see there's some loopholes despite them being like really good players. On AXA, they have a very good, and they were one of the first to have, uh, they were actually the first in 2017 to have a coal uh, policy, uh, but they need to keep up on uh, oil and gas, conventional oil and gas. On Munich Re, they have a good oil and gas policy. Um, and basically I'll stop it for, for this one. I'll go to the next uh, slide just to present a couple of laggards to the contrary. So we have the Lloyds of London uh, markets, which is um, basically now the last major player in Europe without policy to restrict underwriting for uh, the risk related to new coal, new oil, and new gas projects out of all the European uh, insurers. Um, as it's the largest insurance market in the world, they have a huge influence. Um, if they could be activated to go towards accelerating the energy transition, um, 
And at the moment, we're unfortunately in the reality that we have no insurer in the UK that doesn't insure fossil fuels. Uh, so we need to push to have a real climate leader. Um, there are some that are better, some that are less. For the Lloyd's markets and its managing agents, uh, 36 out of the 51 managing agents do not have a policy for the coal sector. And for oil and gas development, it's 46 out of the, of the 51 that do not have uh, an exclusion policy. So that's why there are the laggards within Europe. For um, other regions, we have AIG, which continues to be a fossil fuel insurer, quite an important one. Um, and that also since 2023 has abandoned communities in California um, and doesn't provide insurance to homeowners um, mostly impacted by fires. Uh, for Tokyo Marine, Japanese insurer, um, also a big player uh, that is quite a laggard. They have the worst climate policy amongst uh, five insurers, the five biggest ones in Asia and Oceania. And similarly to AIG, they've uh, pulled out of California. There's not a lot of data um, available at the moment on which insurers are pulling out of which regions, um, but there's more documentation that's being done on these trends, specifically in the US. Um, and I will go to the next slides where you can find more information on this. So um, within our network, we have been uh, ranking global insurers policies on climate. So we have a annual scorecard, Insure Future Scorecard, that scores the top 30 global reinsurers uh, on their fossil fuel policies. We have um, you have the one for 2023, but we have our upcoming one that's uh, in December. There's share action as well that have an insurance benchmark, which assesses the policies and practices of 60 of the world's largest insurance companies across uh, climate change, biodiversity, uh, social and human rights. So larger arms as well. Um, and you have Reclaim Finance that does a ranking specifically on the Lloyd's markets. Uh, last year, they did it on the top 20 managing agents. And this year, October 9th, they will do it on the top 50 managing agents. And in our Upcoming scorecards, there will be more information and data from insurer more around also the ranking of insurers on clean transition and renewable transition. Um, so please next slides and I will end with this one around the opportunities because there's loads of opportunities. Um, you might have seen this, uh, the recent data that shows that to achieve net zero, there's up to $10 trillion that needs um, of commitment in investments. Uh, from 2025 until 2030 that will require insurance capacity. So this opens door to a race to the top and for insurers to play a much more pro prominent role in accelerating the energy transition and making sure also that it respects human rights. Um, and on this, there's a big role actually that investors can play um, is uh, asking insurers to align with 1.5. So set the expectations of the market that this is the norm in having policies that restrict the expansion of fossil fuel at first, that's really crucial. Um, because if we want to in invest in the solutions, we need to basically move away from the problem in the first place. And also invites insurers to accelerate their phase outs with strong and assertive engagements. Um, so there's a huge role that you all can play. Um, and I think we're in this uh, this reality together to, to accelerate the energy transition. And I think it, it will happen in the next couple of years. It's a question of how, how fast and how just it is. Thank you. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you, Isabel. And, and actually, I think you've, you've very helpfully answered one of the questions that we've had through in the portal there of, of kind of how investors can, um, well, how investors and how individuals can help respond to some of these challenges. So we have a little bit of time now for Q&A. Um, as a reminder, please do submit uh, your questions via the engagement panel on the side of your screen. We've had a few fantastic ones through both um, through that portal and in advance of the event today. And I think one thing that, that I'd like to, to start off on, perhaps Isabel, one for you. Um, you, you'd kind of touch there at the end on, on some of the opportunities and there's obviously a divergence in performance between um, kind of actors within the insurance industry. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what opportunities you see for the industry, perhaps for the broader financial sector, if the insurance industry did move faster on climate change. Yes, totally. I think there's there's various ones. Um, citizens are, and businesses are being more and more concerned on um 
aligning basically their um, insurance companies with climate action because they're facing the impacts themselves. So definitely insurers moving away from fossil fuels and increasing their role in the energy transition would be good for their business uh, to get new cons customers. And we're seeing also that uh, renewables now are more um, profitable than fossil fuels. So that basically economically a shift away from fossil fuels that is rapid will be more economically beneficial uh, for the sector. We're also seeing that the um, insurance sector is facing a major generational gap in an aging industry that has difficulty recruiting new talents, young people. And um, there's a 2020 study uh, that estimated that 50% of the insurance workforce will retire by 2028, which is huge. Um, and uh, we know that the younger generations uh, take into account the climate um, engagements and the climate impacts of the industries they want to work with. There's a study that uh, found that 40% of Gen Z and millennials have changed jobs or sectors due to climate concerns and plan to do so in the future, which is quite big. So by accelerating the role in the energy transition, they could be more appealing to younger generations. And also, um, accelerating their, their role out of um, the fossil fuel sector could help avoid major economic risks um, because the climate caused insurability has the potential to trigger cascading failures and undermine our whole economy, not just uh, the insurance sector, but the banks. Um, I assume maybe the investors as well and definitely our government's finance. So the mover, we the, the faster we address the situation, the more we're able to secure a economic stability for for the future that'd be just a couple of insights maybe joel you you have to you'd like to add other elements i think you covered it perfectly and and joel i think kind of picking up on that point and a, again a, a thread that's come through some of the questions um it, it is very clear that, that the insurance industry is, is an incredibly complex area. And you spoke a little bit in your presentation about some of the factors that, that we think about in Green Bank. But I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more about how we as investors uh, take account of, of some of these factors in the construction of portfolios. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the insurance and finance sector hasn't historically been the first place for ethical and sustainable investors to look for investment ideas. And, and I think that's firstly due to its complexity. But I think the main reason is insurance is, is one of the few industries which has exposure to most, if not all, types of business and sector. So from coal right through to, to renewable energy. So it's inherently more complicated than a sort of a single issue. You know, and there's always going to be concerns for, for ethical and sustainable investors about exposure to industries that, that they might not want to have. But that's not a reason not to try and to look for companies with best practice, some of which Isabel has obviously outlined. So the fact is that we, we try to incorporate um, high level issues. So, you know, having a net zero target, is it credible, measurable, and, and can we hold into account through engagement? But I think at a more granular level, you know, and, and noting that for us, the financials are just as important in our analysis as the sustainability considerations, is a company's exposure to an investment in areas such as coal and fossil fuels but also financing of climate change adaptation, whether that's renewable energy or um, sort of wider measures. I think it's important for us to understand as investors what long-term risks are embedded in a company's business model. And, you know, this is on top of the usual considerations such as balance sheet strength, dividend policy, profitability, growth prospects, et cetera. Thanks, Joel. Um, we've had a, a question in about, I suppose, one of the more specific aspects of, of the insurance industry and catastrophe bonds. Um, so I'd be interested in in your views on whether the growth in demand for catastrophe bonds is, is beneficial um, in increasing the insurance of physical risks from climate change. Yeah, so, so very quick background to catastrophe bonds. Um... In 1992, there was Hurricane, Hurricane Andrew, I think it was, that saw $30 billion lost in the US in one day through buildings, jobs, lives lost, cities had to be rebuilt. And eight insurance companies went bankrupt um, due to the unprecedented level of compensation that was required. So I think in 1997, catastrophe bonds were launched and they really took off after Hurricane Katrina. Um, it, it's, a, it's a more specific type, similar to the, the specific types I spoke about earlier. Um, it's it's a bond that's not really been had that much exposure other than sort of pension funds and family offices but they are sort of diversifying risk and they can give attractive returns to investors um you know it's it's a way of 
uh, insurers being able to not having to pull out of certain areas or markets as, as Isabel's outlined um, and the World Bank expects its its issuance to grow significantly in the coming years um, you know covering sort of more countries more disasters and even things like cyber attacks and and terror risks so um, it, it's 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 another example of ways that the insurance industry is being more flexible and using sort of more complicated financial products for more mainstream products and services. Absolutely. Um, and I think we are just about out of time. Um, it was an incredibly uh, kind of informative set of presentations. And, and thank you very much to, to both of our speakers and to all of you for listening and, and taking the time to join us today. I, I usually try and wrap these up by asking our speakers for a, for a note of optimism that, that we can all kind of take out into the world today. But I think we've run out of time for that. But hopefully some of Isabel's earlier calls to action can, um, can motivate you and, and spur some action um, and positive thought into the world. Um, the recording of today's webinar will be available to review on demand and will be po posted on our website over the next couple of days. So do please go back, view that, share that with anyone that you think may be interested but couldn't join us today. Um, I'll wrap it up there, but most importantly, thank you to Joel and Isabel. Thank you once again to all of our audience joining us today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.